Ben and Kimberly have seen God build his church in areas of South Asia where Christians often face persecution. Ben and Kimberly have been struck by the boldness of these believers. The church itself is not scared of coming persecution. Ben will ask pastors every once in a while, well, what if they start putting pastors in jail? What do you, we just preach, we preach the gospel. It doesn't matter. We just start a church in jail. We'll just preach in jail. Yep. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome back to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton. I'm excited to share part two of a conversation that we began last week with Ben and Kimberly. They are gospel workers in South Asia. And if you missed last week's program, I want to encourage you, go to our website, vomradio.net. You can listen to it there. You can also find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's review just a little bit of what we heard from Ben and Kimberly last week. I grew up in a missionary family, grew up in South America and Ecuador, but I was one of those kids that rebelled against everything. I hated God, hated church, hated my family, ended up with 35 felony charges. I ended up pleading to five felony charges of manufacturing trafficking, methamphetamines, given two 20-year sentences, two tens and a five, and was sent to prison. And it was in my prison cell one day. The Lord had just brought me to that point of where I had nowhere left to turn but turn to him. And I knelt down in my prison cell that day and surrendered my life to Christ. And through just absolute miracle in the legal system, I was released, having served just less than three years. We got married toward the end of 2004, and everything was good. And Ben came to me when, at one point and said, I really feel like God's calling us into full-time ministry. He was working, um, building custom homes at the time. I was working construction, mm-hmm. having a good job, good pay. But I just, there was something inside me that, saying, that was saying, I saved you for something right. different. Building right. homes at honorable living, you glorify God through it. But he was saying, there's something different. I have something different. And I, was, and I struggled with that mm-hmm. because here I was a, an ex-drug addict, an ex-felon, and I was uneducated. And I thought, the Lord can't use somebody like me. But yet I knew that he was calling me. So we'd been married for four years when we came to the point where we were in agreement that, yes, God was calling us to something. And then from that point, it was finding where the Lord was Mm -hmm. leading us, and eventually it led us then to South Asia. And now let's pick up where we left off last week. I asked Ben and Kimberly about the rise of anti-conversion laws in South Asia. In a number of places, it is now illegal to encourage someone to follow Jesus Christ if that means they're converting out of the religion they grew up in. Whether that be Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam, it is illegal to encourage them to change their religion. And I asked if these laws put Ben and Kimberly and other gospel workers in South Asia at risk. It it doesn't scare me. I've been to prison before. (laughs) (laughs) You're not intimidated. (laughs) Not that I want to go back, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that seems like a flippant answer, but that's that's the truth. We believe that God has called us to this place in this time, and we believe that we have a message to share, and if there are consequences to that, we'll accept them. We're careful in how we do what we do, mm-hmm. primarily not for our own safety, but primarily so that what we are doing doesn't hurt the national mm-hmm, church mm-hmm. yeah we are very careful to make sure that we are we are doing things so that the church itself is protected um so for example we have a a national team that we work with we're the only foreigners in our region so we work with a national team our team will go into villages and we'll do open air evangelism we don't go with them and do that we let the nationals take the lead with those sorts of things so we obviously can't hide what we're doing in the region that we live and work in And so people know who we are. They know what we're doing. We have a good relationship with the government officials at this point. And so things are okay. But we do, we have seen things change in the last few years. The government will go through every so often and will arrest pastors. 
and just keep them in jail for a couple of days, mostly just to kind of flex their muscles and say, kind of make a point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, just know that we can do this. And and we don't intentionally go down in front of the government office mm-hmm. and do religious work either. So mm-hmm. we don't hide who we are, what we do. We're careful about it. Mm-hmm. But we but we you don't uh, shame them either no. by. Mm-hmm. By sort of sticking it in their face. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And we kind of both believe that that when we leave the region we work in, that it won't necessarily be our choice. We kind of think that day's coming. Mm-hmm. Interesting. There's a great deal of urgency in the work as mm-hmm. a result of that because we want these churches to be able to stand on their own. We want the work to continue because the people are trained and equipped and have been discipled to a point that they have a depth in their faith that they can continue the work. So that if we do have to leave... It's not dependent on mm. the Westerners or anything. Mm-hmm. It can carry right. on and it's strong and there's a solid church. The church itself is not scared of coming persecution. Ben will ask pastors every once in a while, well, what if they start putting pastors in jail? What are you? Well, we just preach. We preach the gospel. It doesn't matter. We just start a church in jail. We'll just well, preach in yeah. jail. Yep. Wow. And part of that, I think, actually is because of the DNA of the church in the country that we work in has persecution within it. There, there are they've still, always seen they've persecution. They've always seen persecution. They've always thought that mm-hmm. was part of following Jesus. Yes. And so it's not a big shock to them. It's, it's just not. like, yeah, okay, it's my mm-hmm. turn. And for us personally and for the church there, we always talk about that if persecution does come to us, it's like the scripture says, for us to be counted worthy mm-hmm. to suffer for Christ, what greater privilege and honor is there? Mm-hmm. And if that day comes, then we'll just... Praise the Lord and thanks for the Lord for it. Not that we want it. Right. We're not seeking it. But, but we're going to always glorify him through it. It is a different mindset, though, to see that as an honor and a blessing instead of as a something to be completely avoided and to be run away from. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to be afraid of yeah. or to fear. Yeah. We're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Ben and Kimberly. They are gospel workers in South Asia. Uh, ben and Kimberly, I want to talk about a village where you have really seen God do amazing things. And I, and I don't think we want to mention the name of the village to protect uh, the work that's going on there. But can you just kind of share the story of how God opened the door in this completely closed place? And now today we have brothers and sisters who are meeting there and worshiping God every week. It is. This village is an incredible incredible testimony to the Lord building his church. And uh, the story of this village is we first went there in 2016, did a little bit of research in the village. It was a village that was very, very dark, very uh, closed to Christianity. Really idle, didn't, idle on every rooftop. Idle on every village. roof. There is, they say as many as 70% of the people in that village are witch doctors one form of power or another. So it was very, very resistant outsiders to Westerners really didn't want any any outside influence. Then in 2016, there was a fire in the village and several homes were destroyed and they called uh, our partner, who's a pastor there in, in the country, and said, could you come help us? We've heard the Christians will help us. And so he called me and said, can we go help this village? Which is fascinating. Like, we don't want Christianity in our village. We don't, but we've heard Christians will help us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, who did they hear that from? That, <laughs> right. That's such a weird thing. Yeah, it is. It is. So we said, absolutely, we'll go. We'll go. And so we went there, and the uh, fire had destroyed several homes. Several families had lost everything. It's a very, very, very poor village. They have very little to start with. And so we went and we helped them with blankets and rice and some of the necessities of life. And when we were there, we asked if we could pray if we could pray for them, and they they said yes that that would be okay. So my national partner and I, a pastor, we knelt down that day and we said, Lord, build your church here here in this village. They 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 desperately need to know that hope is found in Jesus Christ, to know the truth of you. To, they need to know you as their Lord and their God. Just build your church here. So we left that day and didn't hear anything more from them for— mm-hmm. The uh, next time we had an opportunity to be in that village was 2019— so three years later, mm-hmm. three years later. Mm-hmm. We had wow. tried. We had tried to, because we really felt a burden for this community because it, it just felt, we live and work in a very dark region, but this village felt 
darker than like anywhere else. Like the darkest else. part yes. of the dark place. Yes. So. And we had a real burden for this community. And so we tried. We had tried to see if there were water projects that we could do or other humanitarian things that we could do, which is those are the vehicles we use to get into villages that have no presence of Christianity. And the village elders just didn't want us in there. And it wasn't just us. They didn't want our national team in there either. They didn't want outsiders in their community. Especially Christians. Especially Christians. So in 2019, we had two midwives from the United States who came over and we did a series of women's health education programs in villages. And that was the first time that the village elders said, yeah, it's okay. You can come and you can do that here. We'll take that. And we had a couple hundred women come to a, like a six hour education. So one day. Yeah, it was We'll let you thing. come for mm-hmm. one day and, and then we thought, go on home. We thought maybe it was a door opening at the time, but that w- it was fall of 2019. And we don't do much in the winter in our region because we c- it's hard, very difficult to travel between villages in the winter. And once spring came, so did COVID. <laughs> so, and then the our whole world, yeah, shut down. so our country completely shut down and we couldn't travel between villages. And so, just there was nothing that could happen. And then in March of 2021, Ben was preaching at our primary church, and two guys that we didn't know came in the back door of the, of the church and sat down. And we're always a little hesitant about that. And after service, Ben and our national partner went and started talking to the guys to find out who they were. And we asked them where they were from. They said they were from this particular village. And we were shocked. We said, no, it can't be from this village. And they said, yeah. And And they were friendly. And they were friendly. (laughs) And we said, what are you doing here? And (laughs) they said, well, we want to know more about this God you're talking about. We want to know more about who you worship. And, and And we were just... Shocked, quite After frankly. After you picked your jaws up off yeah. the floor, yeah. <laughs> like, sure, we'd love to have that conversation. So we said, we said, great. So we sit down with them, and we begin to share the gospel with them. And in this context, you start at the very beginning. We could say, this is the Bible. This is the Word of God. There's one God. There's not these multiple gods as they believe. There's one God. He's a creator. We rebelled against him as man. We are accountable to him. We sinned against him. It's, it's, so you just have to kind of walk through the whole scriptures, and it takes three to four hours to do this. And at the end, he said, yeah, he said, I'm ready to believe. He said, I don't believe right now. And I told <laughs> him, I, <laughs> I told him, I said, no. <laughs> I said, you're from this village. I said, you know what's going to happen to you if you come to Christ. I said, you'll be disowned. You'll lose everything you own. Your family will kick you out. You'll have nothing. You'll be homeless. You're losing everything if you come to Christ. So you have to be sure about this. I said, I need you to go home and think about it. And he said, no, I'm ready to believe right now. And I said, no, just, just wait. You really have to be sure. I said, come back next week. If you're serious, come back next week. The other guy said, yeah. He said, I'm not so sure. I, I need I need to go back and think about this a little bit more. The one guy, he said, nope, I want to believe right I'm now. I'm not going home for a week. He um, said, I'm not going home. I'm, I'm believing this. right now. So we said, okay. So we, we knelt down that day and, and led him to Christ that day. Mm-hmm. And he, so he was the first believer. And mm-hmm. after that, he told us, he said, there's 12 or 15 more people that are ready to hear this truth in my village. And so our, my partner and I, and we were kind of like, no, there isn't. <laughs> we've tried to crack yeah, that egg. We've been, crack. To your, we've been to your place. <laughs> we know what it's like. And he said, no, really, there is. There's more people waiting to hear. And we said, wow. So, okay. Our partner started going over once a week and doing house fellowship, which we, at that point, we had gone back into a second lockdown. And so it was actually kind of against the rules that he was traveling between villages. Uh-huh. But he would still go over once a week. And he would do house fellowship. This particular village is about a two and a half hour walk from where our campus is, our Bible school is. Walk. Not drive. No, walk. walk. (laughs) (laughs) And every week more people were coming to house fellowship and more people were coming to Christ. And by the fall, by September, there were 14 believers and more people were interested. And what was amazing was so many people came to Christ so quickly that the village really never had time to organize against them. <laughs> and so the the persecution that we expected to happen in this village never happened. Because there were so many. Mm-hmm. Not, not like we expected it to. Mm-hmm. And even that first time that we met, that the church met in this village. So I was preaching that day and we had, the believers were there, mm-hmm. a few new people, and then in walked about 
I can't remember, 14 or 15 yeah, yeah. old men came in and sat down. And we asked people, who's that? And they said, oh, those are the village elders. Those are all the Hindu priests that are here. Oh, my. And so Kimberly looked they at wanna, They want to know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. They were here. And so Kimberly actually looked at me and she said, well, Ben, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to preach the word. And so preached that first message that day. And they, after the service, they said, we want to know more. Tell us more. Wow. Because they had come to check out what was going on, what was this new group, what were people believing in. And so we shared the gospel with them that day, and several of them came to Christ, that first of mm -hmm. the village elders. And then from then on, it just, mm -hmm. the gospel began to spread, and this one man just couldn't, he couldn't stop sharing about this faith, this good news that he now had, mm -hmm. and he wanted everybody to know. When we all walked up into the village for the first day that we were going to have church, we walked up along the path, and Ben said, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? And it turned out that the place the church is meeting in the very first believer's home is the same location that Ben and our national partner knelt down and prayed on in 2016 that God would build a church. That man who was the first man to come to Christ in that village was the man whose home had burned down in 2016. So me and my national partner the very place where we had knelt down in the ashes of that fire that day and prayed that the Lord would build his church in this village. We were, we were just thinking, hey, Lord, just build you anywhere here. It'd be great. And it wasn't the building. It was just the people build your church. But that day, the very place that we had knelt down was where this man's home now stood. And it was top wow. of his home where we met. That, and that's where the church is now. It was, it was the Lord saying, look, look at the way look I'm going to answer your prayer. Look, look what I did. Look <laughs> what I did. Exactly. We couldn't believe. And that was the family that his home had burnt down. And on the, on the one hand, for for people who work overseas, it's an incredibly exciting thing to see something like that, to see fruit of ministry, because there are, there are many, many, many faithful men and women who don't get to see fruit like that. And so on the one hand, it's amazing to see fruit like that. On the other hand, it was absolutely God saying to us, you two think too much of yourselves because you <laughs> thought nothing was going to happen in this village because you weren't doing you it. you couldn't get there. Yeah. But look what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so it's an incredible testimony to say, look what the Lord is doing. Yeah. Look Amen. at what God built in his church, that he doesn't need us. Yeah. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Ben and Kimberly. They are gospel workers in South Asia. Question about that story and about what God did was there anything that that flipped the switch? Did did somebody have a dream? Did did somebody you know have a vision? Did, did was there something supernatural that God did, or was it just the Holy Spirit was working on people's hearts and and drew them to Him? It was just the the latter. It was just the Holy Spirit. What they told us, what we have come to know, is that in all of those years, the villages around them, people were coming to Christ in the villages around them. And in all of those years, from 2016 through 2021, so five years, they were watching. They told us, we've, we've been watching the Christians. We've been watching the church. Because they'd had that interaction in 2016 when Ben and our national partner went and prayed and helped after the fire. And so they watched. They watched as the church grew in the other villages. And they saw Christians who were living lives of integrity, who were sharing the gospel, but were also living lives that matched that. And it it just got to a point that the Holy Spirit had been working, and it got to a point where they said, we want that. We need to figure mm -hmm. out what they have because mm -hmm. we exactly. need some of that in our village. Mm -hmm. And I wow. personally, they didn't say this. I think COVID played a role in it. COVID had a huge impact in our region. It was a really hard time for a lot of people. And I think that there was a in a region where so much is hopeless to start with, and then you put something like that on top of it, I think it was something that just pressed people down far mm -hmm. enough that they started looking. Like, we're desperate. Mm -hmm. well, whatever's out there, we're desperate. So in a situation like that where there is no hope and there is nothing, the next life just repeated over and over and over, they saw Christians who were living a life filled with hope, mm -hmm. living a life that mm -hmm was that there was something more than this, and this isn't our home. Mm -hmm. We're Des looking forward to something. Despite the fact that their circumstances weren't any different, and in some cases were worse off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, there was that, that uh, a life that was different mm -hmm. because, so what if it's COVID? So what if it's whatever? Yes, we will be sad and mourn, 
-hmm. but we don't mourn as those who have no hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they started seeing that and they saw Christians who were living different and they spoke different, they lived different, and they lived with hope. Mm -hmm. And I think Kimberly's right. I think that did play a part of it. So the two men that showed up in your church that day, were they acting on their own or had others in the village said, hey, why don't you go check out this thing and— they were just acting on their they were own. On their own, they they together said, "We just want to go," and they walked in the back of church that day and sat down. Amen. Well, I think the encouragement for us and for our listeners on Voice of the Martyrs Radio is somebody's watching you today mm-hmm. as well. Somebody's watching whether you are living in faith and whether you are living in hope or whether you're not. Mm-hmm. So, I would encourage you be that example, be that godly example. Ben and Kimberly, as we finish up, I always like to help people pray. Let's talk about your region, and you have said it's it's a very difficult, it's very isolated. In many places, there's a lot of darkness. Mm-hmm. How can we pray for these new believers in that village and in other villages who are walking in faith? How can we pray for our family members there? Mm-hmm. For the people there, I would just pray that they will stand strong in their faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is they suffer a great deal more than we do in the Western culture. Mm-hmm. Now, you ask them, are you being persecuted? And they don't even think it's persecution. <laughs> but we recognize it and we know how hard and difficult it is for them mm-hmm. to be an island and mm-hmm. to lose and everything to, that they have in this earthly life right. to gain Christ. Right. It's, it's difficult. So pray for them that they will stand strong in their faith and that they will grow. Mm-hmm. Because they are consistently swimming against the stream. We live in a context where to to be this nationality, to be this culture is to be this religion. And so when you change religions, you're losing your culture. Mm-hmm. You're, and so you're in a place where you're ridiculed. You're losing your identity. Your identity. So you're living in a place where you're, you're – you're ridiculed because you're not celebrating all of the holidays and the festivals and then everything that they do that wears. Mm-hmm. So, so praying that they will stand strong and that you just mentioned identity. And I think that's a great prayer request also that they will learn how to find their identity first in Christ, that that's where their identity is first. Mm-hmm. Um, because that is something that can help any of us, not just people right. in South Asia, stand in cultures that are opposed to what we believe. So that they can grow and understand, like like mm-hmm. Kimberly said, who they are, mm-hmm. where their identity is now found, because they walk away from their family and their culture. And even though they may look like mm-hmm. everybody else now, and they may speak the same language mm-hmm. as everyone else, they're now foreigners and aliens mm-hmm. in their own village. Yeah. There, and so to st- stand strong in their faith and be able to uh, overcome and endure mm-hmm. would be a prayer request for them. What about for you guys and for your work, and how do, how do we pray for you? The main prayer request Ben always mentions whenever we're asked that is for wisdom. We are constantly having to make decisions about who to help, how to help, what the next step is in ministry, what the next village is that we should focus on. Um, as we go back, we're contemplating trying to focus our team on a region that's even more remote than where we are at the moment and whether or not that's even what the Lord wants. Trying to live in a culture that isn't our own, mm-hmm. trying to understand and maneuver through that, uh, how to just live daily godly lives uh, that our testimonies mm-hmm will speak in that way. It's just wisdom in so many areas. We just desperately pray that the Lord will give us wisdom. Well, I can promise you this week there will be a lot of people praying for you uh, (laughs) because I know there's a lot of people who listen to BOM. I hear from them. I get emails from them, and they say, hey, thank you for letting us know specific ways to pray. So this week I want to encourage you to pray for gospel workers in South Asia, pray for the church there, And pray for Ben and Kimberly. Pray for wisdom for them and discernment as they face these challenges and make these decisions. Ben and Kimberly, thank you so much for sharing with us on Voice of the Mars Radio. Thanks for your ministry, and uh, I'm excited for people to hear this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here with you today. Well, it is our our honor to have you on. You are listening to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. As always, if you're just tuning in, you will want to go to vomradio.net and hear this entire conversation. You can also find the Voice of the Martyrs Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. 
And I would encourage you to be back next week. We have these conversations weekly to hear what God is doing. We've heard today amazing things God is doing. We also want to equip you to pray. So be back with us next week to hear more of what God is doing in hostile and restricted nations right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.